It's part six of our conversation with Tower of Power. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. In this series, we talk to three of the main guys in this band. Leader, tenor sax player, and lead vocalist, Emilio Castillo. And on baritone sax, Stephen Doc Kupka. And legendary drummer, David Garibaldi. Speaking of you, I, I, you know, I've been following you so many years, and it's so nice to be finally able to talk to you, but I always looked at you, I'm going, the guy just, either through nurture and nature, you always had a vision. You knew what this was supposed to sound like, correct? Well, yeah, I patterned myself after this band called the Spiders. It was a local band. Spelled with a Y, Spiders, S-P-Y-D-E-R-S. And they were a soul band. And they had uh, three horns. Uh, the lead singer was this white kid named Dennis Delacqua. So soulful. Black people used to come from all around the Bay Area to watch them and just shake their heads. They couldn't believe how soulful the band was, but in particular, this guy, Dennis Delacqua. And he played alto and organ and sang. And I patterned myself after him. And I wanted my band to be tight like them, have great horn section and great background vocals. That's what they had. And then uh, I, I was also watching Sly and the Family Stone at the time. They had just started playing at a local club near me. Well, you and Rocco used to used to uh, sneak in there, right? Yeah, we used to go around the back of the club. The club was called Frenchie's. It was in Hayward. And, and in the back, there was a swimming pool. I don't know if it used to be a hotel or what, but we would climb this cyclone fence and go over the fence and sneak in the back. You know, I think the owner knew. He just, you know, he just let us in. We'd stay there till eight in the morning. They served uh, free breakfast at six a.m. Yeah. And we were there, you know, on weekends, you know, every night watching Sly and the Family Stone before they made a record. And I, you know, I wanted my band to be exciting like them. It wasn't like I wanted to. Uh, you know, do their style. I wanted the excitement that he had of live performance. You you would have been like around 20, right, then? I was 23 when I joined the band. I had just gotten out of the military. Yeah. And um, I was playing in a club in Oakland with subbing for their drummer, the drummer who got injured somehow. And the subs were me and Mike Clark, who played with Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters. Oh wait a minute! This is the band with the, the with the funky name. What was the name? Reality, of the, band? the Re reality sandwich. They were a bunch of drug dealers and weirdos, and so you know, it was perfect for the times. And so you know, that's how I met. You know, it's a Skip Mesquite and Mick Gillette. God bless those guys; they're gone. But they were they come to to play. They come to sit in. One night they come in. They said, you know, we're thinking about making a change in drummer, you want to come check us out. And so that's when I went to hear them at Keystone Corner. And I knew I was going to be in it even before they knew it. It was just something I was so, oh man, I'm in this. I'm not kidding. That was my, that was my thought. I, I never had one thought that said, maybe it was, this is it. I'm not kidding. Uh, when you met Emilio, what was your, what was your impression? Oh, they were young kids. Uh, he was 17 when I met dad. Uh, a great little soul band and choreographed and playing uh, not only the, the pop tunes of the day, but also um, some more obscure R&B tunes. And, you know, they have background harmonies and a little three-piece horn section. And I was very impressed. And, you know, I immediately wanted to be in that group. So that must have been difficult, though, with like what, what, what led to you saying, Jack, uh, we're going to make some changes. Oh, no, it wasn't my decision. It was the producer of the record, David Rubinson. He didn't like my brother, the way he played drums. It wasn't that he didn't like him. He didn't like the way he played drums. And he didn't like the way the guitar player played guitar. And he said, you know, I'm going to get some studio guys to do the album. It was our first record. We didn't, we were amazed that we got signed by Bill Graham. We didn't, you know, that was out of nowhere, you know. And, uh, and, and, you know, the guys started fighting over this. They thought we were going to lose our record deal. And my brother and Jody are, you know, practicing more and more and more. And it seemed like the more they practiced, the worse they got because they were just so intimidated about, you know, the whole situation. And finally, uh, I said uh, to the guys, I go, you know what? I'll take Jack and Jody and Rocco and we'll start over. You guys can have the record deal. I, you know, I'm the one that put it all together and I'll, I'll just go do another band you know and uh and that's what i was going to do and then we did this gig uh it was a charity gig on tv for kya radio and after the gig my brother came up to me and he said you know what 
I don't want you to do that. I want you. I, I want you to stay with the band. He goes, they're 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 nuts over there, man. He goes, they're they're falling apart. Without you, it's not going to happen. And it's a great opportunity, and I don't want you to miss it. So I'm going to go back to Detroit and be with our parents because they need one of us to go. And uh, you stay out here, you know. And he said, just get even with those two guys. Two guys were making it really hard on. Them. What was your What was your impression of, for instance, because I, I have them on on this, the, all three of you. With Doc and Emilio, what was your first impression of them? I loved them. Yeah. I loved them. I thought they were just unique. And then when we started playing together, it was just, uh, we just fell right into each other, you know, go right in, in step, you know, and we'd hang out all the time and play. And, you know, Tower Power was like seven days a week. It's, it's a, a lifestyle, you know, and when we were all living here in the Bay Area, we would rehearse every day and then when we started touring we would uh come back from from a trip get off the plane maybe we'd tell everybody okay tomorrow morning see you at 11 o'clock we start rehearsal you know rehearse and so we had a rehearsal hall in berkeley berkeley california at san pablo and chaucer that was the streets and it was on this corner right on san pablo avenue and we rehearsed there quite a lot then we just we shared it with a band called the Loading Zone, and so when we decided to go out of there, we uh, just I guess couldn't afford to do it anymore. So we we went over and started rehearsing at Studio Instrument Rentals in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, Fourth and Folsom. This was ground zero because right there was a Studio Instrument Rentals where all the bands had rehearsed. You had Santana, Ronnie Montrose, Journey. That's where Journey started. Their first rehearsals were in that place. Boz Skag. Billy Cobham, Herbie Hancock had his band in there. And so right across the street was CBS Records, which became the Automat. And so people would go in there and they'd rehearse in studio instrument rentals, then push the gear across the street and go and record over at CBS. You know, it was brilliant. I mean, and it was so much happening there. When I, I remember when we would be in there rehearsing, all the rooms were full of who's who in San Francisco music scene. They're all in there all the time. And so we, even when we were, weren't rehearsing, we'd go there just to hang out because we were all friends with everybody. And so we'd go there, you know, watch rehearsals and smoke weed and get have fun and go crazy, you know. And it was just, uh, it was kind of ground zero for all of the music that was being made in the Bay Area at that time. So cool, you know. Well, with like bands like Yes, and there's like Chicago's the same way, not because of the horns, but because of, of in and outgoing members. There are a lot of people who came in and out of Tower of Power, but you guys remain a very strong unit. Uh, I mean, you, 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 three of you guys have been there a long, long time, but really, uh, how do you guys keep it together? Like, what, what is, what's the glue? Well, uh, that we remain popular enough to uh, sustain it. That's the glue. We like each other. You know, most of the time, almost all the time, and uh, you know, we play well together, and uh, and we all know the uh, know what it's supposed to sound like because we don't deviate much. I mean, a little bit, but don't deviate from the uh, original uh, vision of the band. You know, playing that snap snap funk and uh, and jazzy R and B and uh, snap funk uh, music with good lyrics and like that. So, yeah, we just uh, uh, have been able to sustain it. It's a miracle. I mean, you know, you check these bands out. They're burnt out after seven years. And, uh, you know, this is it's fifty coming up on 53 years for us. We'll have more of our conversation with a great Tower of Power coming up in three, four days. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Stream Music. <laughs>